And there's nothing like a countdown screen to make you a little bit nervous to begin a call. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I see attendance is jumping up as everyone joins today's call. A lot of mobile users today. That's something that we haven't had a lot of before on Welcome. So I'm really excited to see how that, how that goes for everyone. Uh, do let us know. Uh, so, without further ado, welcome to today's call, a brief history on emulation, virtualization, and containerization uh, with Zane, the VP of Data Engineering here at Andela. We're really excited to see everyone. But before we jump into today's event, uh, we do have a little bit of housekeeping. Welcome is a little bit different to Zoom or some other tools. We have a big production here many of many interactive activities for you to take part in. So the first thing we have is a chat window. You should be able to see this on the side of your screen if you're on desktop. Um, I haven't tried it yet on mobile, uh, but you should be able to bring that up. Um, and we also have a Q&A tab. So what we'll ask of you is do interact in the chat box throughout today's call. Let us know your thoughts, feedback, general chat um, and then jump into the Q&A tab to ask us questions. So what we'll do is we'll have a Q&A session at the end of today's talk and then we'll bring up questions on screen from the Q&A tab. You can also vote on questions in there. So if you see a question throughout the talk and you're like, I really, really want that one answered, do make sure to uh, give it a, I think it's a thumbs up or a vote up. Uh, so do try that out. To get you used to the chat window, uh, I see a few people, Stephen and uh, Santosh, have already started letting us know where you're calling in from today. So we have some people in Bangalore and Nairobi, two incredible locations with very exciting meetups happening, I believe, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So Zane will bring you up on stage. And... We have a lot of people joining today, as you can see in the chat. We also have a few other people from Kampala and is it Kilfi uh, in Kenya? I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, I do apologize if that isn't correct. Uh, today, we also have people from not only Andela's uh, talent network community, but we also have people joining us from the Andela learning community and also uh, some members of the general public as well. Uh, so hello to everyone. If you are not a member of the Andela Talent Network, do check out our website, andela.com, and have a look at reasons why you might like to sign up to Andela today. Um, if other people calling in from Lagos, from Sri Lanka, a number of people from Lagos, that's incredible. Um, Zane, would you like to jump into a little bit of an introduction and then we'll maybe ask people a few questions before we jump into the talk? How does that uh, sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Vanessa. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, so everyone, I'd love to introduce you to Zane, who's on screen. Zane is the data VP of data engineering here at Andela. And he, is, he joined Andela only in August of this year. Uh, which is incredible. Uh, you're based in Austin, Texas, and has a lot of a lot of interest in gaming, a lot of open source contribution, retro gaming, and obviously data modernization, and a lot of history and experience in healthcare. Do you want to tell people a little bit more before we jump into slides? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as Vanessa said, I, I joined Andela fairly recently. Uh, you know, my, my day profession is uh, a, a lot around data. I, I lead our, our data practice um, uh, data engineering platform uh, at, at Andela, and I've been doing that with uh, several organizations in the, in the past. But uh, one of my passions, you know, um, throughout, and it's maybe something that probably got me into the tech industry in the, in the first place, is really around video games, right? So I really grew up on these consoles, right? Starting with even 10 d 1000 Atari 2600, of course, the, the venerable 8-bit original Nintendo Entertainment System and so on. Uh, and throughout that time, you know, I've, I've also 
Uh, I got into tech. I, I love playing with different operating systems. Um, I, I actually, in, in college, I worked as a technician uh, in IT. So around how to hook computers up, networking, all of that, I you know became a huge fan of. And um, as I kind of you know progressed through my career, I figured out how these things are, are interconnected. And I you know I've always wanted to do a talk like this. And I actually done done this uh, just just one time before, but. Uh, uh, wanted to share some of the things, fun things that I, I found out about about this domain with with everyone here. Fantastic, and I think that leads us perfectly into our first poll of today, uh, which is: What was your favorite retro gaming console uh, of all time? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a little countdown on this, but we will give you a moment or two to answer. Um, you should be able to answer in the side of your screen. Um, so do try to answer and they'll pop up on screen. Fantastic. I have to say the one that really stole my heart isn't on today's list as it was very light touch, but I was a Nintendo Wii fan. Wii Sports and Wii Fit were definitely a lot of a lot of family arguments at Christmas time. Uh, very for competitive <laughs> memories there. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, with these choices, I, I limited in terms of the number of things we can put put on there. Um, the, the Wii, obviously, one of my, my personal favorites, uh, you can kind of tell this is, uh, a lot of these are what I consider retro, retro consoles, right, from way back, you know, the 80s, right, 1980s, exactly. that is. Um, it, it, this, this poll is interesting because I think it, it gives us an idea of, of the audience sort of, you know, wh where you are. Uh, I don't, I don't see uh, a lot, a lot of people picking the Nintendo entertainment system, right? Um, so Sony PlayStation is just more, pro relatively speaking, a little more recent, right? Yes. Um, and just to clarify as well, that is the Nintendo in entertainment system, 8-bit, uh, unfortunately welcome cut our sentences off a little bit when creating the poll, um. But I think, is it fair to say that looking at this poll and similar polls, you can kind of guess people's age groups a little bit by their their favorite consoles? It, it, it is possible, yeah. Um, I I, th I think that, yeah, because we don't put the numbers, right? PlayStation's up to five, Nintendo, I don't know how many iterations there there have been, right? So when people say PlayStation, I also don't know whether they're referring to the, the, the latest generation or the original. My intent here is That's actually, true. if you can tell, consistent with the others, is that I'm talking about the really old systems, right? Definitely. I think we will close the poll out. An incredible uh, number of people jumping into our first poll. Um, and I think, does that give us a good indication, Zane, on, on where to go with today's talk? Um, uh, I mean, I sure hope so. <laughs> the, the talk's <laughs> kind of so, so, you know, that I is apologize if, if, you know, some of the, some of these things are uh, a little bit before people's time, but hopefully it'll be interesting to, to, you know, think about the history here. Fantastic. And I think I will hand the stage over to you now, if you'd like to uh, screen share your slides and we'll pop those up. Yeah, let's let's go for it. Is that is that looking okay? Perfect. And I'll vanish for everyone and let Zane take the stage. Okay, thanks. Thanks again so so much, Vanessa. So um, you know, I, I've already done the introduction. Uh, it's just some of the pictures here. Uh, that's that's my daughter kind of playing with me, and she's becoming quite the quite the, the accomplished and avid avid gamer, which I'm I'm really proud of. Uh, the other, the the power glove, one of my favorite peripherals. I don't know if people remember the the movie back in the day with Fred Savage called The Wizard, where it's effectively an infomercial for Super Mario Brothers three. I actually had one of these uh, until somewhat recently, unfortunately. Um, so today's talk, I uh, wanted to talk about sort of three topics. Um, you know, th these are, are humongous topics uh, in and of themselves. So there's there's really no way I could I could cover these in, with any kind of real detail. So this talk is is kind of intended intended as a as a survey. Um, you know, what I wanted to cover are timelines and key milestones in in each of these domains. Uh, some of the techniques right involved in doing these things. Uh, and and com compare and contrast sort of you know why why we have these three things things and why they're all kind of alive and well at this point. And one of the things I wanted to do is really 
uh, present the aspects of interconnectedness, right? How these different architectures and techniques sort of influence and impact each other throughout history, uh, and and why the line, you know, between these things sometimes are much blurrier than they they seem to seem to appear. So on to the first topic, right? Em emulation. So what is what is emulation, right? Like I think this this slide sums, sums it up pretty well. A software hardware system that enables one computer system to behave like another system, right? Some some I think very notable examples that, that people probably have seen or heard of, right? R Rosetta, right? When when Max kind of went went onto the Intel platform, right? From PowerPC, there was a there needed to be a way to run old software uh, that's compiled for PowerPC to to run on run on Intel. So uh, Mac OS introduced this feature called Rosetta that you know very very you know you know, cleverly named, uh, that translates uh, PowerPC to, to Intel instructions. And of course, Rosetta 2 with the introduction of the M1 processors. But other things, right? Like people are into kind of retro gaming. If you have a, a Raspberry Pi running RetroPie, right? That's, that's an emulator. Uh, if you kind of are a fan of old old DOS systems, uh, DOSBox, right? Uh, it's Commander Keen, one of my favorite shareware games from back in the day. Uh, Java Virtual Machine have an asterisk next to it. Probably talk a little bit about, about that later. Uh, if you're into the, into sort of gaming on the Xbox, right? Uh, how do you how do you play old games? The original Xbox on the 360, and then the 360 software on Xbox One. Well, that's that's through emulation. And then one of my favorites, like the Chungus Two. Uh, I think in in sort of late 2021, there was uh, some articles talking about this. 8-bit processor that people have built in uh, in Minecraft, right? Which is which is sort of insane. Uh, running at about one hertz, right? 8-bit processor that can actually run some software. I think there was a game of Snake that's shown on the screen here that does that. I think another another thing to to call out is that um, when, when we talk about emulation, it's not just about CPUs, right? Um, subsystems and devices on these machines need to be emulated as, as well, right? The, the memory, the disk, any coprocessors, sound controllers, BIOS. And these are pretty important, right? When you, when you uh, start talking about emulation of, of console systems. Um, how are emulators used in the industry today? Well, there, there turns out to be quite a lot of different use cases, right? Uh, commercial software emulators, that's that's a little bit more, more sort of uh, back in the day, virtual, virtual PC, um, software that lets you run Windows uh, and, and PC software on the Mac, uh, replaced by you know mo more modern solutions at this point. Uh, virtual Game Studio Engine, there was an original Sony PlayStation 1 emulator uh, on the PC that lets you play games. There's, there's actually a, a couple of different ones here. Um, commercial backwards compatibility, right? You talked about for consoles, I think it's a pretty pretty popular way to, to run, run kind of retro gaming uh software right on the Wii for the virtual console on the Wii the the Xbox backwards compatibility and no doubt right many other systems as well uh commercial hardware emulators right so so you can actually do emulation in hardware and that's what a lot of vendors chose to do so when you buy these things called the uh, classic mini retro, right? Whether it's for the Nintendo for the Sega Genesis uh it's effectively emulation in, in hardware. Um, Interpreters runtime. So this is interesting, right? Like Python VM, Java VM, uh, .NET, uh, the common language runtime. You know, Java virtual machine. It's called a virtual machine. So what, what's that about? Why why are we saying that that's emulation? Well, it turns turns out that uh, Java virtual machines are not necessarily uh, virtual machines, right? Like what? <laughs> um, certainly not in the same way that uh, VMware. Right? When you think about a virtual machine in VMware in in AWS, for instance. So in this way, I think I think the common language runtime is a is a much better moniker, right, than than the JVM. Um, in fact, uh, they represent a, uh, a a a sort of virtual system, right? Like so 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 Java Java's code, as some of you might know, right, it's it's intermediate bytecode compiled to to run interpreted on on the on the VM, right? So they're, they're really not uh, virtual virtualization per the definition. Um, of course, retro gaming, and then for system enthusiasts, right? You, you got emulators out there that that simulate the original, for instance, 68K Mac, uh, the Commodore 64, right? DOS and, and other things. So a lot of different use cases for these guys. So just wanted to show a timeline for for a little bit, right? Like, and, and some of this uh, kind of markers here really are 
our, our, our milestones and our markers and history around just what, you know, when things were. And so I think that the term uh, emulator, right, according to some articles out there, was coined, you know, way back in the day in, in 1962, where you're talking about, okay, how, how do you sort of simulate one system with, with another? But even as early as 1965, you, you saw some commercial use, right? The original 7070 sort of processor and system uh, if you wanted to run on on a more mainframe like uh, time sharing system, you uh, you you had a solution for that, right? Even even in 1965, uh, and then jumping forward, Microsoft was actually founded just in '75, right? And then of course Microsoft DOS. I don't I don't know how many people kind of had had a, had a, you know opportunity to use DOS. I think my my first version of uh, DOS was maybe about three or so, uh, and then Windows was also around two or three. Uh, nowadays, what well, Windows eleven, right? Um, but but you know, if you look at the the sort of Intel, Intel now is on a on like twelfth gen or thirteenth gen core system, so maybe twenty at least twenty generations of, of processors. Uh, back in the day, the the first right, most venerable kind of one, eighty eighty eight, eighty eighty six. When they invented the, the second generation of that, there was actually no easy way to to run the original eighty eight eighty eight software because it was uh, a different, a slightly different architecture. So in fact, there was an emulation mode right that needed to be put into the the system to to really just even let you run the original software. Uh, other other terms like you know thirty thirty two seventy. If any of you ever worked with mainframes, uh, in, instead of SSHing right through console, you have this thing called the terminal terminal emulator that that simulates the original screen on the on the mainframe, right? So just wanted to call that out. It's not it's not just CPUs and, and systems, right? Sometimes it's a it's a particular function that you you need to have emulation for. Uh, and then when you start seeing commercial uses for this, right, the Commodore, the, the really kind of popular Amiga system out there, uh, the Commodore 64, there was an emulator to to let you run Commodore 64 uh, software on there. Uh, when when Sega um, re released uh, the, the Mega Drive or the Genesis, as, as people may know it, right, the original Sega Master System, there needed to be a way to run that backwards compatible software. So, so there's, uh, again, a use of, of emulation there. And then uh, once you start getting into the 80s and, and 90s, right, late 80s, you start, people start thinking about, you know, is this, is this legal? You know, can, can people really do this? Like, what, what is really the intellectual property here? Uh, and you'll see more, more on, the, on the next slide. Um, but, but even, you know, the FPUs, right? Like in, Intel for the longest time has separate processors for floating point and, and uh, integer instructions. Uh, so if you buy the more expensive version, I think you used to call it the DX versions, so you'll get the coprocessor. And people actually wrote software emulators for the coprocessor so that you didn't need to buy the expensive software, uh, sorry, expensive hardware. But, uh, um, you, you know, of course, it ran much slower because it wasn't in, implemented in, uh, in hardware. So looking at sort of a little bit after that, right, what, what some people call the golden age of emulation. Uh, and certainly about, about the time when I kind of uh, was, was sort of seeing what's in the scene, um, uh, you know, around the, the mid to late 90s, people really started working on on solutions, right? So as you see more consoles coming out, right? This is now Genesis, Super Nintendo. Um, even, even in 1991, I think people attempted to, to do a little bit of emulation, right? For the, for the Mega Drive, people tried to, to create Nintendo emulators, but I, don't, I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to try that, so I don't know how well that, that worked. Uh, but around 95, 96, I think one of the, the first right, emu scenes, uh, the, um, the virtual Game Boy, right? People wrote software, you can see this is a Windows uh, software uh, that, lets you, that lets you actually execute uh, Game Boy, right? Like images uh, on, on the PC. And then, you know, quick, quickly following, uh, people started looking into the Nintendo 8-bit, uh, the Genesis system. And, and they did this because these systems were still uh, relatively modest in terms of hardware, uh, what what hardware were in them, and with uh, the the PCs at the time, you could actually effectively run them right, like at, at near near real speed. And as these techniques got got better, you you got to really a, a full speed experience running on the PC for these retro games. And and because of of sort of the advances here, like you're actually getting a a really good experience while running this software. People started doing this a lot, and and you know as part of this, right, piracy started 
becoming rampant because the, the the software themselves for these games are are you know intellectual property of the companies that made them. So the IDSA actually started started cracking down, right? They they noticed that the thing becoming popular, uh, and then there's a there's quite a few different lawsuits started started coming out around this for for people trying to trying to do this. There there are actually people trying to do this commercially, right? Like if you look at Sega Smash Pack, right? The uh, package for for the PC that release popular games like Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, it was actually based on an uh, on a sort of semi open source project called KGen, right? One of the two major kind of best best Sega Sega Genesis emulators out there. And it was a company that made a piece of software. If any of you remember, I right, called Bleem that lets you run PlayStation One software for the PC. But it immediately got got a lawsuit from from Sony, right? And I, I think one of the things they started flushing out is like, what is what is the IP? Because the system is somewhat open to architecture, right? You you, you know what the processor is. Uh, how, how how can you say like you know people can't write write software to emulate that? And so it turns out they said that the BIOS, right, the in, input output system, that that's proprietary Sony. So if you wanted to emulate, you can't use the BIOS. So companies like Blame, they they actually had to reverse engineer it. Right or you know, otherwise, for 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 users want to use it, you need to sort of legally get a copy of the BIOS, which you can dump. People provide instructions on how to dump that uh, from your actual PlayStation. Um, so, talking a little bit about emulation, like strengths uh, and weaknesses, right? Emulation can be one of its true strengths is that it can be very very precise, right? Um, you know, it will fully mimic all the idiosyncrasies of the original hardware platform, so that you can run the original system with high fidelity. Um, I recall when I was back in college, right, uh, still using using Sun Solaris workstations, uh, compiling a version of X-Main, right, just to try, try it out. And this, is, this was in the, I think, uh, mid, mid 90s, right? Uh, it was just fantastic. Like I was blown away by what, what the software can do. Um, and it, as I talked about, right, emulation can be done uh, in both software and hardware, right? So you can build a, 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 a piece of hardware to actually do this thing. And, and you can do things with emulation that the original hardware couldn't do, right? For any, any, any of you that uh, maybe have, have looked at emulators before, you know, they have these really, really popular features called save and load states, right? You can snapshot all the memory, all the registers uh, into files so you can bring it up later, right? Like a very quick resume. Um, you can have, have enhanced graphics, right? Like PlayStation emulators actually uh, leverage modern graphics cards, and you, you get kind of bilinear, trilinear filtering, uh, at, you know, full screen anti-aliasing that that the original system didn't do. So you get actually an improved experience over the original. Some people might say that that's blasphemy, right? You, you want it in, in its original glory, enhanced sound, other things. Uh, and of course, you can you can do this cross platform, right? You you can run the software not only on on Intel PCs, you can run them on Macs, you can run them uh, on other hardware as, as well. Um, just just to to hit the point, right? Like the the you know with with high fidelity comes comes the cost. You, you actually really have to understand how the original system works. This is a, a diagram. Not going to deep dive into this. Um, the the picture processing unit for the original. Uh, 8-bit Nintendo, you can see that um, the idiosyncrasies, right? Sprite zero hits X on visible image starts at H2, right? That's ungodly in terms of complexity, right? Each scan line on the screen as, as it's rendered, you have to keep in mind sort of which cycle of CPU you're on and what, what magic actually happens there, right? So if you ever looked at the source code for one of these emulators and, and, I, and I actually have, um, uh, it's, it's just sort of almost insanity, right? Um, uh, another sort of weakness of emul emulation from a technique perspective, right? It's slow, right? 10, 10 X, the 10 X factor. You, you, you probably would have heard of this, but uh, mainly when people are talking about maybe interpreter versus compile code, well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good analogy to that, right? Um, you, when, you, when you're dealing with compile code versus interpret it, you are gonna, you're going to compile the code into native right, like instruction architecture for, for the system. As opposed to interpreter, you still have a runtime that is there interpreting the code. And, and this is exactly the reason why emulation is slow, right? It, it's operating more in an interpreter mode. S similar thing with what, what Java does, right? Java or CLR or Python, Ruby. Uh, you're, you're kind of processing intermediate code in an interpreter mode. 
uh, of course, there are a lot of techniques, right, to, to make that even faster. So, so what are those things? One is sort of pure compiler optimization, like make your runtime faster, right? You can optimize big time there. Uh, multi-threading. So, so one of the open source projects I, I contributed to back in the day, I, I actually created a port of uh, the 8-bit the Nintendo entertainment system for a handheld device. At the time, a profile similar to the Game Boy Advance, um, it was called the, the, the GP2X. So it's open source, actually running Linux. And this, um, this device, what was cool about it is it had two different processors, right? Not necessarily running in symmetric multiprocessing mode. But what you could do, if you could somehow leverage both processors, you actually make things faster. So I actually had the, the sort of fastest port, the most popular port of the Nintendo emulator for that system because uh, I figured out a way to put the sound processing on one of the processors on the 940 uh, and keep the keep the actual main uh, runtime loop on the six, uh, on the, 90, the the 920 processor uh, and turned out it ran about twice as fast as other other software that was out there so people people really liked it of course there were some challenges how do you synchronize the two threads right it, it took some magic and had to had to do it in, in assembler and a little bit of machine just machine code actually in binary to to make that happen. Um, other other techniques to make it go faster, of course, you can you can do frame skipping, right? Like I don't maybe I don't need to render every frame, uh, I render every other frame, so now I can I can go faster. And frame rendering is actually pretty expensive uh, for these older systems because even even with a modest sort of three three twenty by two forty uh, you, you know kind of resolution, there's actually a lot of you know memory spaces to to go through. So skipping frames turns out to be a, a nice technique. But uh, one of the more popular techniques, and this kind of gets into, uh, if you look at modern software, right, like just in time uh, compilation, right, the JIT, the JIT engine is the technique to dynamically recompile uh, code for for whatever system, right, into something that's more native that can run uh, run faster on the on the system that you have. Uh, you know, power PCs were doing this way back in the day. The the J, JVM introduced JIT technology in in ninety six. Uh, Deck Alpha. So I actually, you know, I re recall my internship uh, with digital equipment, right? That was eventually became Compaq and became Hewlett Packard. Um, uh, they had these wonderful machines, right? Called the called the Alphas, Deck Alphas, that that run way way faster than than x86s uh, back in the day. But they didn't really have much software for it, so they needed to really run Intel software. And there was a version of Windows uh, that ran ran on Alphas, right? Even way back in the day. Uh, so they had this amazing kind of piece of technology called the FX32 that dynamically rec recompiled code at runtime and actually at night it'll go and optimize, right? I think I think it's not dissimilar to what Ros Rosetta does to, to some extent, although at that time uh, software ran so fast that you, you really didn't need to do that offline anymore. Um, so one thing, uh, uh, you know, one key marker uh, was this piece of software called the Ultra HL HLE which is uh, stands for high level emulation. It's a it's a piece of software that uh, this group released in '99 that allows you to run that Nintendo um, Nintendo 64, right? Like emulate the Nintendo 64 on PC. This was was sort of revolutionary in some sense because uh, if you look at the system for for Nintendo 64, it had two processors, right? One for the the, the main processor, a, a VR4300 running at about 100 megahertz. And then a GPU, right? They called, they marketed it as a reality engine running at 60 megahertz or, or ish. So the combined about 160 megahertz, right, of processing, uh, processing power. At the time, you have Pentiums that, uh, you know, 166, 200 megahertz, 233. How do you how do you run something that is sort of that many clock cycles, right? Because like, you know, don't you take a hit of 10x? So this team, you know, what was amazing about this, and you see this graphics, this Yesse Podia in 1999, right? P people just didn't believe it when it came out. Everybody says this is fake, right? And and I actually tried it. And I was like, oh my god, this is this is real. They used a technique called high level emulation, and what that what that kind of means is that you know instead of emulating instructions line by line, maybe don't do that, right? Parse the instructions, figure out what it's trying to do. Oh, okay, this set of instructions, this function call is trying to trying to draw a triangle. So, so don't go through every line of code for calculating the triangle. Instead, just render the triangle with a higher level function, 
right? So that's why you needed a, a 3DFX card. I don't know if anybody knows, like people probably know what NVIDIA is, right? Like 3DFX was one of, the, NVIDIA actually acquired 3DFX for, for their IP. There were these really amazing graphics card back in the day. They were competitor to, uh, to, to sort of some of the other known vendors. Uh, and and it, it, could, it could render 3D really well. And so they basically figured out in the code what, what they were trying to do and translated those into high-level instructions, right? High-level function calls. And that's what enabled them to actually run this thing in real time. Uh, it was, was quite uh, an advancement. And you'll see from a little bit later, uh, this technique is, is even used today, right? In both virtualization and to some extent, uh, containerization. So summarizing kind of the... Um, Emulation thing, right? Like it's a tech, this technology has been embraced by the industry for a lot of mainstream use cases, right? And it's, it supports the growing retro gaming industry. Uh, and you, you see it widely available, right? On today's consoles, PCs, Macs, and, and other sort of home, home entertainment systems. Um, so, so moving into the second one, I wonder if we have a time for another poll here, um, talking about virtualization. Let's see. Is there a poll out there? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. I'll go on, and maybe we'll we'll, we'll get some time to come back to it. Sorry, right. um, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, yes. perfect. Um, we're just having some green green room issues at the moment, so we are going to open a new poll for everyone, which should be able. Uh, Zane, can you actually stop screen sharing for a moment? Uh, uh, I can, I can. So we can pop up our poll. Welcome's just being a little bit funny with us today. So, uh, have you used virtualization in the past? Uh, Zane, if you'd like to give a couple of examples for each of these answers, I know Welcome cut off a couple of the sentences here. Yeah, especially absolutely. Around yeah, infrastructure so, uh, and work. Yeah, the intent of this poll is just to look at people, you know, how familiar people are with virtualization technologies and in and, and what context you've used them, right? So the first one is more recreationally, right? There, there's the software uh, VMware Workstation, uh, VirtualBox, right? Quite a few other things out there um, that you can use locally, either on Macs or PCs, uh, even on Linux as well. Um, of course, you know, for, for work, right? Like everybody, whether you know it or not, it's, chances are your servers are backed by some sort of virtualization technology. Uh, more explicitly, if you use the cloud, right, you do, do some aspects of DevOps, um, you are kind of controlling the lifecycle of these virtual machines them, themselves, right? And then of course, like if you're sort of not familiar with virtualization, um, hope to talk a little bit more about that, right? Chances are that uh, in this day and age, um, even if you're not familiar with it, uh, you, you, you probably use it, right, Un unknowingly. So it looks like a lot of good split between kind of the, the recreational use and the... Um, uh, not necessarily recreational, right? Even workstation or virtual box, you, you could use com commercially as well. Uh, but you know, good, good portion of people kind of right, really hands-on DevOps uh, as well here. So I think that's what what the poll is telling us. Definitely, I thought we'd have a little bit more DevOps. I think it's becoming increasingly impossible to avoid AWS um, in in all development. Um, but that is a great great result to to the poll. I'm going to close that off now um, and we should be able to screen share again. Yeah, let's get back to it. Um, so virtualization, right? Moving on to the, the second topic, um, you know, virtualization, the process of running virtual instance of computer system, right? In a layer abstracted from the actual hardware. So, well, you know, that sounds a lot like emulation, right? So what's the, what's the difference? Well, um, you know, the difference is that you're running software that was capable of running on the original hardware uh, to begin with, right? That's that's how you're able to take advantage of, of uh, the, the hardware running natively, uh, your software, right? Without going through the interpretation layer. So what that means is that if the original software is compiled for Intel x86, you can only virtualize it on the x86, right? The operating system has to support that. Uh, some of the key tenants, right, equivalents, the VM should be indistinguishable from the underlying hardware. And we'll, uh, we'll see that that's mostly true, although there are also some exceptions to this. Um, you know, efficiency, right? The, when you execute instructions, should be executed directly on the under underlying CPU without involving the, the hypervisor, right? And, and, and that you should have com complete control, right? And this is really important for, for the cloud and for modern infrastructure. 
um, how does this use? And this is, the poll goes a little bit to this, right? Desktop virtualization, right? People use this. Parallels, uh, VMware Fusion allows you to run, um, you know, Windows software on on the Mac, right? And back in the day, there was a software that eventually I think Microsoft picked up. Uh, it was called Virtual PC. It was an emulator, not a virtualizer, uh, so they run much slower. But with the kind of in, kind of creation of workstation, uh, these solutions, right? You, you now have a legitimate way to, to run the software and run it at a near near real-time speed, right? Like what, what you would have expected to run on the original hardware. So that that was very desirable. Um, but things that you maybe don't don't think about as much, STK gaming, right? For, for sort of Android, uh, iOS developers out there, there's also solutions here, right? That involve virtualization on, on um, uh, if you're an Android developer, use Android uh, Studio. Uh, there's a layer called the Intel uh, Haxam that actually lets you virtualize um, software, right? And and while most Android software is, is uh, done for, I think, other processors, there is a, there used to be kind of commercial Intel-based uh, Android software as well, right? So if you if you compile the software for uh, to, to make it Intel compatible, then you can run it and virtualize it on the PC, right? That's why you, you get a, a huge speed boost from speed boost from doing that. Uh, of course, right? It, you know, in in sort of uh, today's infrastructure, uh, server consolidation, whether it's on premise or in the data center, right? There, there's a, a huge commercial need for this. So going through the timeline for this. Um, uh, again, I think there, there's a very rich history around virtualization as well, right? Dating back to sort of 19, 1960, 67 even, right? Like um, in, on, on the CP67, each user turned out to be virtualized in some way, right? They, they actually own a VM. That's how you sort of do time sharing back in the day. Uh, but even in 85, you had an attempt to, to do virtualized 8086 software right, on, on, the, on these systems that, that I, I certainly hadn't heard of uh, back in the day. Uh, but, but as you progress, right, like, you know, VMware, I think, was one of the, the, the first really successful commercial solutions right, on, for, uh, for supporting virtualization on, on, the Intel, on the Intel platform. And, and the reason is that the, the Intel 80, x86 architecture wasn't really, you know, intended, it, it wasn't designed with virtualization in mind, right? Not until, you know, more recently when, when you, you had these uh, hardware instructions to support that. Uh, but when VM, VMware came out, I think it, it sort of, right, like really disrupted the industry in terms of people thinking about what they can do with it. Uh, and, and quickly follow up, right, uh, other solutions out there, the, the Zen source, Zen, Zen project, right, eventually, I think, acquired by Citrix. Uh, and at the same time, you know, not on the Intel side, right, Sun, you know, back back in the day, it was before Oracle acquired Sun, Sun Microsystems, right, Solaris, uh, they had quite a few different solutions for supporting uh, both virtualization and what's eventually became containerization, right, um, as well on, on their OSs na natively. So just looking at, and then eventually there's this thing, VMware uh, ThinApp, right? It's a, it's a concept called application virtualization. We'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and, and, and if you look at sort of 2017, some AWS, right? In order to support their, their growing business, like how do they think about virtualization to support, uh, support the cloud, right? They've, they've done some really incredible things there. So similar to emulation, looking at strengths and weaknesses, strength runs fast, right? Because you're running your software natively without, without translation, uh, hardware assisted, uh, right? Hard, hardware assist improves security, uh, reliability as well. But weaknesses, right? There's some complexity here, right? It requires hypervisor uh, and OS support for that hypervisor. Uh, the hardware, right, again, must be compatible with the software you're trying to run. Um, you can support some enhancements, but not all the things that emulators could do, right? You can't easily overclock, underclock, right? In, in software, uh, can't skip frames per se, right? And uh, uh, you can't run on some, some, you know, the hypervisors can't run certain things like Solaris x86, uh, BEOS, you know, not macOS you technically can, but there's just some licensing restrictions that prevent you from doing that. So uh, techniques, right? Like um, OS patching. So in the in the initial kind of release of, of VMware, what they did was this is before the day where hardware support uh, lets you do do things, right? You didn't have Intel Intel VT or AMD EMDV. Uh, they actually uh, patched code in real time, right? They looked into the operating system. 
uh, and they actually patch the code to they're like, okay, I know, I know what this, uh, uh, what, what this routine is trying to do, and I'm going to patch it so that it's actually working better with my virtualized runtime. So that sounds pretty familiar to high level emulation, right? Like you got to figure out what, what the meaning of the thing actually is and do that. Uh, so you trap reads and you, you patch, patch your OS code, right? Um, eventually you didn't need to do that anymore once you had hardware assistance instructions. Um, Zen took a very different approach, right? It's something called pair virtualization. They effectively changed the code of the OS ahead of time, right? Not, not, um, you know, at, at, at runtime and did sort of the same thing, right? Like this is the unit of thing. So you have these pair virtualized uh, disk, disk drivers, you have pair virtualized sort of network drivers that enabled it to uh, run a lot faster. But some people could say that it's, it's cheating a little bit, right? Like you, you now change the original architecture of, of both the OS and, and potentially the software, right, to, to do that. So all of that changed once, once you started getting hardware support uh, for virtualization. And here, you know, I want to just call out like what, for instance, what, what AWS did, right? Like they, they kind of, in 2017, 18, you know, they, they started announcing this thing called Project Nitro, where uh, prior to that, they were effectively using ZenSource, right? A heavily, heavily modified Zen, uh, Zen implementation for their data centers. And they said, you know, we needed to, to things to run faster. So they're like, how, how bare metal can we really get, right? So they started uh, this project called Nitro that they, they incrementally kind of replaced each piece of, of the hardware architecture, right? The, the network drivers, the, uh, the, the sort of the BIOS, right? The, 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 the disk system to, to the point where you're effectively bare metal, right? This custom piece of hardware requires no hypervisor at all to run. Right, the hardware itself is is inherently virtualizable. Right, that's how how you'll see like in a new generation of AWS VMs, you can actually get the entirety of the memory. Right, like if it's a thirty two gig machine, you'll get thirty two gigs. As opposed to earlier generations, you you'll see you subtract a little bit. Right, like thirty one or thirty, because you need some overhead for the for the hypervisor. Well, with with this kind of um, you know progress, you don't need to do that anymore. So it's it's quite amazing, and I think every every kind of cloud vendor has some sort of technology similar to this today. Um, and then some of the other platforms that maybe people don't don't really think about, right? Like um, you know what is so people may, may have used Wine it allows you to use Windows software right on on Linux. Uh, Sigwin allows you to to use Unix software on on Windows. Uh, Co Linux, right? Way back in the day, way before WSL, right? Very popular. Uh, WSL v1 and v2, you know, are are you know are these virtualization? Like Sigwin, you say, well, it's that's just recompiled open source software, right? How can that be considered virtualization? Uh, generally speaking, I would agree, except that you know, um, you need a runtime for for Sigwin, right? You can't just recompile. You actually have a a couple of supporting libraries that effectively virtualizes the uh, the I/O instructions, right, on Windows to to make sure it can talk with the OS. Uh, but yeah, that's still not not really there. Wine, right, allows you to use unmodified Windows binary uh, on Linux, right? So is this virtualization? Well, um, you know, it, it's kind of close to the idea, right? Because you're you're running unmodified binaries, but you need a lot of supporting, right? The hypervisor, if you call it that, for Wine is much much bigger, and I think it it sort of crosses into this domain of what I call application virtualization, right? Which is I think effectively eventually became uh, what we call container containers. Right, and the idea is that um, you have this process that deceives an app to, to believe it's interfacing with the operating system when you're actually not. So there's a, a layer in between that facade that acts as a facade to the OS, uh, and it actually kind of you know you're not actually writing to the location that you want to write. Uh, you, you know, you, you get sort of sandbox in terms of the rights that you do. And to some extent, you might even get some, some sort of resource constraints on, on what you're doing. Um, and, and in fact, like things like Python VM uh, really just leverages this concept, right? You can create a VM, you know, each, each sort of your areas will have its own dependencies so that you're not actually writing to the host OS, right? Um, that's starting to sound more and more like containers, right? So one of the, the more commercial versions of this is, is from VMware called Synapse, and I've actually sort of used it just a little bit in the past, uh, allows you to kind of bundle up, let's say, like a Microsoft Office runtime. And I, you can actually run that on any machine, right? Not not having to actually have installed Microsoft Office natively on the system, you could actually run it 
because that runtime packages up a, a kind of virtualized application, virtualized environment, including all the registry entries uh, to needed to run. And any any time the software is looking at the registry, instead of hitting the actual Windows API call, it will hit uh, the the facade runtime right in the software to that virtualizes that that system. So adoption. This uh, I apologize. This is kind of I hadn't updated the slide right as of twenty twenty. Um, as of as of 2020, uh, you know the adoption is is huge, right? Around virtualization, data, desktop, application storage, uh, and of course, is is continuing to grow in the industry. So, last one, containerization. I, th I think I'll just go through. Maybe skip the skip the poll for this one. I know we're a little bit short on time here. So, so the the, the last mile of the of this, right? Like, what is containerization then? Um, it's a lightweight alternative to virtualization, right? And what you're what you're really doing is operating system virtualization, right? In, in, instead of virtualizing the entire hardware platform, you're virtualizing the OS. Um, uh, and what you can do here, right? There's some really huge advantages in that you can sort of even partition the subset of the the resources on that on that system, right? To to run for each each of your containers. So uh, different from vir uh, from from virtualization through things like VMware, you you wouldn't have to install an instance of the OS at all, right? Because the container actually uses the host OS itself. Um, you know, how it is used. Of course, server consolidation is similar to virtualization, right? And it has less overhead. Uh, people use it and develop a ton, right? Support CI CD, uh, package of delivering content, right? Like with control on the, your dependencies on your environment itself. Uh, you, you know, Docker, Docker is a very popular brand name uh, in containerization. There, there are other solutions out there as well. Um, you know, and Windows itself has, has containers, right? It's, containers not just about Linux, right? Windows actually has a kernel that supports containerization as well, and it's available on Windows servers. Uh, VPSs, right? Hosting. You, you know, be, before everybody kind of move heavily toward uh, to, to the cloud, the cloud, right? These virtual hosting providers, GoDaddy, right? Like you use versions of of containerization that's heavily modified. Um, and the, the the reason they do that is like if you have to handle as much load, you want to handle as much load as possible. Uh, you know, virtualization doesn't make sense, right? You, you have you suffer so much overhead for each VM that you run. But if you can do that in a super lightweight fashion, right, that you have almost no memory overhead at all, uh, you can put a lot more load, right, on the same hardware that you have. And, and of course, uh, commercially, right, like there, there are a lot of uses in the cloud, there are native services, EKS, ECS, AKS, and Azure, uh, but also, right, in the data space, which is, you know, something I, I do a lot, uh, Apache Spark clusters, like, you know, Blue Data, for instance, uses Kubernetes and uh, I think maybe Mesos um, and, and containers, right, to to spin up uh, clusters and compute for this. So, so looking at timelines a little bit, a uh, little bit shorter, right? Containers came sort of after this, but but there are also like the concept was was established uh, way back in the day as well, right? Even you know in the 70, 1970s, eighties, uh, you had these concepts and and people try to do things like. You know, jails were, were were sort of conceptually like the the sort of beginnings of of containerization. Uh, again, similar to application virtualization, it it kind of puts this constraint around like you're not really a facade around where you're actually writing to, uh, what what you can do with the system. Uh, you know, implementations from Solaris, from Linux, right? people started really doing this and thinking about the commercial viability. Uh, and, and then sort of Docker, LXC came around, right? And then packaging of, of these things, eventually leading to Google's Kubernetes, right? For, for more of, much more advanced container orchestration. Um, you know, some of the strengths, a lot less overhead, right? In terms of where you're running, uh, you know, tremendous portability, right? Assuming, you know, the, the containers are supported where you're running the things. Uh, you, you can package up your software and just run it however you want. Uh, highly agile, right? Like you, 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 all the software for, you know, creating a Docker image is pretty easy, right? For developer familiar with it. Uh, your, your startup time is super fast. Uh, although I would say, like looking at technologies, if you ever have a chance to look at the tech talk around Windows subset WSL2, uh, Microsoft's engineers talking about what they did. Like they, they reduced the the spin up time for WSL two to under a second, right? And that is actually a lightweight VM. So it's getting into the space very similar to what what containerization can actually do. So I think one of the reasons why WSL two is super popular and, and and powerful, right, in terms of what it can do. 
of, of course, uh, with, you know, with things like Kubernetes, right, or, or like back in the day, maybe Docker Compose, right, thinking about orchestration, like how do you get different pieces of containers to work together as, as, a, as a cohesive piece, uh, a system, right? Uh, so that's a, what allows it to do distributed computing pretty well. Uh, weaknesses, right? And, and a lot of these are being corrected as, as we speak, right, as the industry is progressing, but security uh, traditionally, there's been concern, like, do you have true isolation? Because you're trusting the kernel to do the right thing. Whereas in virtualization, the hardware hypervisor guarantees this, it guarantees this isolation. Uh, orchestration is complex, right? Anybody try to set up their own Kubernetes cluster knows that there's there's quite a bit of complexity involved. Storage, right? There's no, you know, with Docker, the notion of storage is a uh, Docker is intended to be sort of more ephemeral, right? Stateless. So storage isn't necessarily supported that well. There are ways to obviously do that by mounting storage, but it's not it's sort of where its strengths are at. Limited hardware abstraction, right? Like if you had a custom piece of GPU like you wanted to support, uh, there's not as easy a way to do that. Whereas with virtualization, you can you can easily support sort of custom hardware as well. And then of course, compatibility, right? The OS has to support it for you to do that. Um, some of the techniques, change root, legacy, that's what allows you to do jails in the first place. Uh, C groups, right? That's the sort of the kernel addition that allows you to isolate resources. Uh, C groups and namespaces, right? It's really what allowed Linux, uh, Linux kernels to support containers. Uh, again, similar to, to Python VM, right? Abstraction around where you're writing, where you're loading and writing the thing from. Um, just a visual representation of Docker containers, right? Like if you look at where the host kernel is, uh, in virtualization, you have this hypervisor running on top of OS, right? In a in a type uh, type one, I think, or type two kind of way. Uh, whereas in Docker containers, you really just have uh, one copy of the, the host operating system, right? And it's running multiple virtual environments. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. Docker LXC, like if you use, like they, there, there's some, some benefits uh, and things you want to think about, right? What Docker does versus something like LXC, which is closer to WSL. Uh, adoption and implementation obviously continue to grow, right? By, by 2023, more than 70% of global organizations will be running some sort of containerized application. And I think that number, we, we might actually be past that number uh, at, at this point. So, so summarizing, I think ho hopefully people get getting a sense. I you know I know I rushed through this a little bit, but getting a sense of sort of how these three domains of of, of tech techniques and architecture kind of kind of sort of support each other and blend together. Um, you know, takeaway I would have is like when you when you're looking at runtime and performance and resource, um, you know, as you go to the right, right, like you're going to be more efficient. But uh, certainly, you know, true uh, some time ago, and maybe still true today. When you look at maturity, compatibility, portability, or security, right? Like, I think I think you go in the opposite direction, right? Containers are more limited; they run things faster, uh, you know, in a, in a more agile way, but it's less feature rich in terms of what you can do with it. So, with that, I think I will, I will conclude. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. I don't know if there, if there are any questions out there but hopefully this is uh yes. yeah gives you a good over overview of uh of, of the topics here that was fantastic thank you so much zane uh we have a few minutes for questions um there we are a little tight on time if zane's available to stay for maybe two minutes past the hour that would be fantastic Absolutely. if not yeah. that's that's okay um but if you do need to run off to another call straight away anyone who is watching uh, we will send out the slides later on, and this call will be available to watch back probably in the next 48 hours. Uh, we'll just give it a once over um, and then make it available for everyone. We do have a couple of questions, and I have one or two to ask as well. Um, the first question is, uh, can I run Windows images on Linux uh, or Mac systems? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right. I think that's. I would call that this is the primary use case for software like VirtualBox, right? Like I, I might recommend VirtualBox is com completely. So there's an open and free version of that. You effectively, what you can do is you can get an get get a, a CD image, right, a boot image for Windows, which Microsoft distributes for free these days, believe it or not. Uh, and you can just uh, kind of boot that up, right, and it'll go through the whole uh, Windows install process, and then you'll be running uh, Windows on on Linux or Mac or even Windows on Windows. Absolutely. 
perfect. And Mina also asks, uh, when should I use containers? This good yeah, I, I think the, the, the primary use case, I think today, is what I've seen is really around DevOps, right? Deployment of software packages. Um, in fact, you know, because of the, you know, the stateless nature by design of Docker, it doesn't work as well as something like Windows subsystem for Linux, right? WSL, because you want an environment that you can keep booting up and, and shutting down, right? It keeps your files, whereas with Docker, it doesn't really do that. So when you deploy sort of, you know, production software for, um, you know, for, for your jobs, I, I would say like, uh, containerization is a really good way to do that because you control the dependencies that your software has. You don't have to depend on somebody like IT or someone else or yourself, right? Installing those dependencies on a, a particular target system, right? That's, this is sort of the power of, of containerization. Um, but if you're sort of doing experimentation at home, um, you know, you want to play with say like Jupyter for doing a little bit of data science, uh, I might recommend WSL, right? If you're on Windows um, or, or just virtualized solution like VMware Fusion, because containers, you know, takes a little more setting up, right? You have to write Docker files and, and create the environment just the way you want it. Uh, and, and while, you know, some people would love doing that, others may be a little, little gun shy with, with, with trying, to, trying to pull out it together. Um, so you have both options available to you. Fantastic. And a lot of people are asking, um, do you think there's anything coming after containerization and what improvements do you think are out there or on their way? Yeah, yeah. It's such a, such an amazing question. Like I, I, you know, uh, I have to think about it, right? Like, I, I don't know, like con containers, like if you see sort of the progression of things, it's getting lighter and lighter, right? Like the, the layer of abstraction is moving higher and higher. So now you're at the sort of layer of um, application virtualization or, or OS virtualization, which is containers, right? Uh, eventually, maybe you get to sort of process process virtualization, right? Like for, for software that's used out there. Um, yeah, I don't know if this makes sense or not. Like, you know, for, for, for popular software, I, I, I don't know. I, I can only think of Salesforce in my head. I don't know why that is. It's not, not my favorite piece of software. Um, but for, for people doing development, right? Maybe, maybe there's a very easy way to, to replicate that. Of course, you know, you could set up a, a Docker container for, let's say, like, or, you know, Oracle database or something. But, but maybe people will think about, right, like, it's really just about moving up, right? Like, if I think about the, the direction of things it, at the OS level, maybe at the process level, and, and maybe there's sort of magic, like, you know, with, with the advances around AI and, and sort of data science technology, maybe they figured out sort of you can train a neural network to, to sort of process uh to, to do sort of smarter translation across different architectures, right? You, you could do some really amazing things. I think these containers maybe will be uh, instruction set architecture independent, right? Whereas today, you, you know, you, you absolutely have to be dependent on, like it still has to be x86 kind of software, right? But now that there are you know, a lot of sort of risk processes out there that are mainstream, uh, are there ways to make it completely hardware agnostic, right? A very light, uh, and still still have all the power, right? The agility of, of containers, uh, what they can do today. I'm kind of making that up, but but I think, you know, there, there, there's, there's certainly possibilities here. A lot of possibilities. Um, we have a couple of questions coming into the chat as well. So unfortunately I can't pull them up on screen, um, but what are the chances, excuse me, uh, what are the chances of virtualizing on mobile phones uh, on iOS or currently on Android. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think what prevents this from happening is more licensing kind of kind of challenges uh, as opposed to hardware. Because I th I think this is already possible today, right? Like if you, if you look at sort of you know what Google has done, they they recently released a beta version of the Play Store, right? It allows you to run Android software. Uh, on Windows, of course, Microsoft itself with Windows 11, you know, claims to, to be able to do that already. Uh, and I've seen many different emulator implementations on Android, right? Uh, that allows you to run retro systems. So, so in theory, there's no reason why you couldn't run uh, iOS software on Android, but I think license would, would definitely prevent you from doing that. Uh, and on iOS, you see a little bit less of that because your app store is, is sort of more strongly governed than the Android uh, Play, Play Store. Uh, so you don't see these solutions. But if you look on Android, um, you, you'll see a lot of interesting kind of emulation 
techniques, right? Less virtualization because, um, uh, again, you don't really know, right? Android, Android is so wide that you don't really know what you're running on. You could be running on a processor that doesn't support it. That's what, this is where like emulation is the most flexible technique, right? For, for doing this. I muted myself there. Oops. Um, and another question, um, and then we'll do this question and one more afterwards. Um, any thoughts on a shared hosting type of containerization? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the things I was talking about just briefly, right, is VPS, is virtual private servers. Uh, I think th they're effectively based on containerized technology, right? Virtual also is, is something close to a container Right, uh, technology because when you do share hosting, you want to put as right from the hoster, you know, hosting person's perspective, you want to put as much load on the hardware as possible, right? That's how you sort of make money, I guess. Uh, so you want to use the lightest technique that you can. So virtualization is out of the question, right? Certainly, emulation doesn't wouldn't make sense at all. Uh, so so most of those techniques out there are based on some form of modified containerization, even today. And I am going to jump in with a question. If someone has joined us today and they have a lot of experience in in their field of programming or engineering, and they haven't got involved in any of the three topics we've discussed today, being emulation, virtualization, and containerization, or even retro gaming, what is your advice on how to get started in any of those topics? Oh wow! I mean, there's there's just there's so much literature out there, right? If you just Google, uh, you know, virtualization, I, I I think that the challenge is that you'll be overwhelmed, right, with the amount of content out there. Um, I I think I I would maybe recommend starting with Wikipedia. Uh, honestly, like I I think that it's a reasonably unbiased perspective around what these things are. So so starting with that, and you'll get I think ton of great references. Uh, to to sort of other articles, right? That that you can follow up on. Uh, the other thing I would say is to try it out. Like right? you, you really won't won't get an appreciation for it until you've actually done a little bit of hands on. Uh, and so I think this is true. Sort of, sort of you know uh, on the emulation side, I might start if, if you're sort of Windows inclined, like DOS MU for instance, right? That DOS box. Just see what it looks like to run old DOS software. It's super super easy to set up. Uh, virtualization, you know, for, download VirtualBox, right, and get get a copy of Linux set up running on a Mac, right, just to see how you can run another OS, and and containerization, right, like follow a tutorial on Docker and and see how you can set up it. Even the Hello World, right, gives you some sense, uh, but maybe extend a little bit beyond Hello World and run run like you know compile your own program and see see what it looks like running in a containerized way. That's great advice. Um, once again, Zane, thank you so much for an incredible talk. Um, I've certainly had a lot of fun. Uh, what I will do now is pop up some extra information uh, for people, especially in the Andela community. So first of all, we have plenty of events. Um, and I realize that they're not visible. Uh, hold on two seconds. Ah, if I throw myself off stage, you can't hear me. Um, we have a lot of events this week you might have seen on Slack. Uh, there is a lot going on in the Andela community. So do make sure to jump in and have a look at your Andela calendars, but also uh, have a look on Eventbrite for some of our regional events uh, starting this Saturday in Islamabad. And also in Lahore, we have a number of meetups coming all the way through November and December. So keep an eye out for those. We have different calls on uh, healthcare and also Town Hall is tomorrow. The last big update uh, for Town Hall for our Andela community is happening tomorrow. And then a very special Town Hall on December's Town Hall. So thank you all. Um, I would also just like to mention that today's call is also uh, sponsored by Andela Chat, uh, ever so slightly delayed by a few days due to due to bugs, but we will get there. And Andela Chat is coming. Uh, this is your opportunity to be in the community and the platform all in one place. So do keep an eye out for that launch, and you will get an email. Thank you all, and see you soon. Thank you so much.